Para Martinez. Hi. With the next talk. Hi, Julio. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you well. So his subject is the two body problem in general relativity and quantum scattering amplitudes. Julio. And okay, more importantly, do you see the blackboard? Um, yes, I do, but I don't know. Do people see it? I do. Is it clear enough? Ah, a little pale. I don't know. <laughs> but okay, I can read the book. Let, let me just. Uh, is it better? A little better for Hi. me. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I thought uh, it would be nice to uh, for a change instead of looking at a virtual blackboard to look virtually at a blackboard. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, uh, well, thanks for the invitation to to give this tutorial. I did very nice workshop. I'm learning a lot from from the other tutorials. So this is the title I was given: the two-body problem in GR and quantum scattering amplitudes. And I was told uh, to uh, um, be pedagogical. So uh, um, I, I don't know if I will say anything new to the experts, but at least I'll entertain them, and hopefully everyone else will will learn something. Uh, so just uh, as as uh, a motivation, um, as Justin was explaining, in general, solving uh, the Einstein field equations, it's hard. Um, um, so we have to resort to some kind of perturbative approach. And, and there's two, two perturbative expansions that we usually talk about. One of them is the post-Newtonian expansion, where we expand, so this is typical for a bound system, where we expand both in velocities and GM over R. So GM over R is some long distance expansion where, where the distances between the two objects are much larger than GM, which is the effective Schwarzschild radius of the system. Um, and for the scattering problem, it's more natural to think about the, the post minkowski expansion, which is, um, is to all orders in velocity. So it, the, the system can be relativistic, but we have a small parameter, which is GM over R. Okay, so uh, I'll try to explain how, how, to, how, do, how do we want to solve this kind of problem using field theory methods from in scattering amplitudes. And it's kind of an old idea, this, this uh, kind of trying to solve the field equations in some sort of self consistent way and eliminate the gravitational field to just focus on the dynamics of some, some matter, like these compact objects. And it goes all the way back to Feynman, Wheeler, others. And, and its first incarnation is what, uh, what Justin was explaining, where you actually solve the field equations for the gravitational field and you plug them back into some borderline action. and and so in the modern language, this is like integrating out the gravitational field uh, to get some effective action that describes the motion of some matter, which is described here by some momentum and, and coordinates in, in some sort of generic way. Um, and, uh, and there's a modern incarnation of this that takes into account that, again, there's this near and far zone separation of the gravitational field. So there's kind of the conservative part, uh, which we call potential. I will be explaining what that means in detail. Um, and, and there's a radiation part, kind of the far zone, uh, which, which can escape to infinity. So this is the instantaneous uh, exchange of gravitons, which can be integrated out. And, and this is the field that escapes to infinity. And we want to solve for this kind of, uh, uh, these two problems separately. But one, one of them is integrating out these potential gravitons, uh, which describe the conservative dynamics. And the other one is to take into account the, the radiation. Okay, so. So a, a few disclaimers. So uh, this is the last time I will be citing anyone. So I decided to not cite anyone who's alive uh, to, <laughs> to not get in trouble because I didn't cite someone else. Uh, and um, also for the most part, I will be using units where plus minus one and two and pi and i equals one. And uh, um, and the last one is if you have any questions, please uh, stop me at any point and I'm happy to to answer during the lectures rather than at the end. So the question that I want to ask is, can we use modern on-shell amplitudes methods to help solve? I will explain what I mean by solve the two-body problem in GR. And by, I, want to, I want to emphasize on-shell as, as something distinct to what we were talking about, because uh, for instance, what Justin was doing or these more modern EFT approaches, they, what they compute is some sort of effective action for the two-body system that then you can use to solve like, the field equations and get some classical gauge invariant observable. Whereas I wanna focus on, on directly the observables, things that are have support on the equations in motion and, and that is more natural from the point of view of amplitudes. 
And we, we will do this first for the scattering problem and then try to use that knowledge to say something about, about the Inspiral. Um, so uh, I, I had this, this teacher in undergrad who uh, used to say that, um, that uh, progress in physics goes backwards. So we used to know how to solve the two-body problem in, in classical gravity. And then when we do quantum mechanics, we cannot tell like position and momentum. So even one body problem is problematic. And in quantum field theory, we ever even get confused about the vacuum. Despite that, I think there's some reasons for optimism. I'll try to convince you that using field theory can help uh, uh, tackle this, this two body problem in, in GR. And, and the reasons for optimism is that it's useful to focus on gauge invariant quantities or observables. Uh, so these are things that we can compare to one another that uh, there shouldn't be any confusion about coordinates, anything like that. Um, also, there's very powerful methods uh, for recursion unitarity that let us go to very high orders in perturbation theory. And there's other things like double copy that tell us that the complexity of a gravitational problem should be roughly the same as, as a problem in, in gauge theory squared, at, as, at least as far as scattering amplitudes are concerned. And when you combine this with modern ideas in field theory, like effective field theory, tools like dimensional regularization, multi-loop integration, but we have this kind of wide range of machinery that we can try to use to, to help solve this problem. Um, so what is the problem? Um, so the problem is just, we want to understand the time evolution of, of some system, two-body system in GR. And there's two versions, uh, just like in classical mechanics, there's kind of the initial value problem. And in, in the quantum setup is so-called in, in where where we specify the initial conditions, like some velocities and, and coordinates, and then we want to ask what happens after, after some time. And in this quantum mechanical, you just have some in-state, there's some out-state that uh, is the time evolved in-state, and then you're asking what is the value of some observable in the out-state. So I won't be talking too much about this kind of problem, I will be talking more about the in-out, which is like boundary value. We specify the, in, the initial and the final state, like when we try to solve some differential equation um, classically. And, and the question to ask is what is the overlap between these two states quantum mechanically, the in-state and the out-state? And why does anything have to do with scattering amplitudes? Uh, because what relates these in-states and these out-states that come from infinity and go off to infinity in the scattering problem is the S matrix. So there's uh, the out-state is just the S matrix acting on the in-state. So it's some unitary operator and and in particular, we always separate into kind of a trivial part and, and what we call the scattering amplitude. Okay, so, so this is just to motivate that scattering amplitude has something to do with time evolution. So the time evolution of this two-body two -body system should be encoded in the, in the scattering amplitude. So what I mean by a solution of this two-body problem will be if I give you the scattering amplitude, and we'll talk how to calculate that, how to extract the relevant pieces that describe classical dynamics. Um, there's kind of a more like on cell solution, which is from the amplitude, how we calculate gauge invariant observables. These are, for instance, the scattering angle or the time delay uh, in the scattering process or the radiated energy, the radiated angular momentum, et cetera, et cetera. So there's an analogous quantities also for the inspiral problem, like the very astronaut advance, the orbital frequency and, and some others. So that's what one, one approach. Uh, um, another one I will, tentatively called off-shell. It's not off-shell in the sense that we also use the scattering amplitude with an on-shell object, but the, the, what we extract from it, it's a more off-shell quantity, like a, like a two-body Hamiltonian, which is gauge dependent, as Justin mentioned, or for instance, the stress tensor of the binary system that will tell us how it couples to the, to the gravitational field, uh, the radiative gravitational field, something like a radiation reaction force, which will depend on, on, these, on these multiple moments. Um, Okay, so the outline uh, will be day one. I will just focus on how to compute this, how to identify the relevant pieces, like the classical part of the amplitude, the conservative part of the amplitude, uh, which, which parts are we interested in, which parts are quantum and we're not interested in. Um, so I, I'll tell you how to distinguish classical versus quantum and, and what is the PM expansion in the context of the scattering amplitude. Also how to distinguish conservative versus dissipative. And if I have time, We'll see, I will tell you how we actually compute them using unitarity and probably I won't have time to talk about integration, but maybe I'll say something. Um, and tomorrow I'll tell you how, how these arrows work, like how to go from the amplitude, the classical amplitude 
to to the observables or or, or this um, this uh, dynamical quantities that let us solve for observables. Okay. So uh, any question about this while I raise the blackboard? Let's get started this is by setting up what we mean by, by scattering amplitudes and how we're going to be encoding the dynamics of, of compact bodies. So let me just call this a QFT setup. So this is very simple. It's just we want to integrate out all the microscopic degrees of freedom of some compact object. So if we have something like like a black hole or, or a cat or uh, whatever you want, we are gonna replace this by some point particle, uh, which is created by some quantum field. And, and we all, we're gonna say that this thing couples minimally to gravity. So we're gonna have some action that is uh, So it's just this, this, this uh, field coupled to gravity. So uh, in principle, if, if we don't care about the spin dynamics, it will be just some scalar field. And everything that tells us is where, where this particle lives. Uh, and if you're interested in, in spin, then you can replace this guy by some like massive higher spin field. Let me just denote it by this. So it will have some indices uh, that will describe with the spin state of, of this, this object. Um, so um, I, I, I won't be talking about this too much. Also, one can encode the actual structure of the object, like the finite size, and of the tidal deformations can be encoded in, in some higher dimension operators that we add to, to these actions. So for instance, the, the, the first one will be something, which usually it's called love number. So it will be some coefficient that tell us that this scalar field couples to the Riemann curvature squared. Okay, so, uh, so we have some systematic way of encoding all kinds of effects that have to do with, with the dynamics of these things as some sort of fields interacting with gravity through, through some high dimension operators. And, and our starting point is gonna be to calculate the scattering amplitude. Um, so the scattering amplitude Everyone has their favorite way of computing it, but so this is the two to two scattering amplitude, the four point amplitude for, for these scalars. And this is gonna be some sum of our diagrams, not necessarily Feynman diagrams, but just objects with propagators that encode kind of the local interactions in space time of these fields with something like this. And uh, okay, so this is gonna be the momentum P1. P2, P3, P4. In my convention, they're all outgoing. And then in here, the, the, as this body, inter this, these uh, objects interact with gravity, which I'm denoting by these Wrigley lines, then they exchange some, some momentum. Like at this point, this is gonna change momentum L1, L2, L3, et cetera, et cetera. And, and the total amount of momentum exchange is just the momentum transfer. And I will be calling this Q, this kind of P1 plus P4. Okay, so what are the scales in this problem? How do we distinguish uh, classical from quantum? So there's three scales. So this is the only time where I will be using H bar not equal one, just for, for illustration purposes. So the smallest scale is gonna be H bar over M, where M is the mass or, or the energy of, of one of these, these uh, two bodies. And this is essentially the Compton wavelength of the particle, okay? So it's clear that if we want some classical dynamics, this has to be very small, and this has to be the smallest scale. The next scale is gonna be uh, G times the mass. Um, so what is this? This is basically the effective Schwarzschild radius, the system, so we want the, classical gravity to be a, a good description and that this is what this inequality tells us that this is the classical regime where 
RS is much larger, much larger than the quantum wavelength. And then the, the larger scale is gonna be H bar over Q, where Q is this momentum transfer. And, um, and what this is, is basically conjugate to the, to the distance between the objects or, or the impact parameter in some, some scattering process. Um, and uh, so, so equivalently, let me just multiply everything by the inverse of this so that we, we deal with, uh, with um, um, dimensionless quantities. So the, so the expansion parameters are gonna be this. Okay, so expansion in Q over M just means quantum. Quantum corrections will go like Q over M. And the expansion in RS over B, this will be the Poznan Kaussian expansion. As I said, this is kind of GM over R. Um, um, so, and, and both, both of these quantities are, are, are small. And the, the classical corrections, which are encoded inside of the amplitude, they will be encoded as corrections, which are given as powers of this uh, small quantity. So hopefully that's clear. And, and as you see, uh, it's very easy to keep track because uh, we can enforce that both are small by just saying, we're gonna expand in Q, the scattering amplitude. We're, we're gonna expand it in small Q. Um, and as long as we're doing ordinary perturbations here where we also expand in G Newton, then we will be enforcing this, this scaling automatically. However, uh, note that, uh, that this is not the same as the usual perturbative expansion. In, in some gravitational effective theory. So sometimes we like to say, oh, this Poston Kauskin expansion is just the usual perturbation theory, but it's not. Uh, the usual perturbation theory in gravity. So gravity is a non renormalizable, renormalizable theory. So uh, uh, G Newton or M Planck has, has I mean, uh, ha, G, G Newton has dimensions of inverse powers of, of and Planck. So the usual perturbation theory in gravity is an expansion in small G times the energy squared or G times the mass squared being small. But this is the same as uh, kind of uh, E squared over M Planck squared. Notice that because we are enforcing this, uh, this inequality here, we are saying that GM squared is much greater than one, but much smaller than one. Uh, and what we learned from this is that actually, um, even though we will be doing a fixed order calculation, perturbative calculation of a scattering amplitude, and we'll be trying to look for these GM or Q corrections, um, the, the classical expansion actually knows about all loop orders in the scattering amplitude. Uh, um, so, um, so the intuition about this, uh, is that the amplitude on, or one plus the amplitude, this is given by some kind of path integral, which semi-classically is just e, e to the i s, where s is some, some classical action. Okay, so, um, so this s will have an expansion in these two small parameters. So s we can expand as powers of q over m, and also as powers of gm q. And this will be telling us if we're more quantum or more classical, this will tell us which order in, in, in the Potsdam Minkowski expansion we are at. But once you expand this exponential, it all gets mixed up in the scattering amplitude. So the scattering amplitude uh, is, is, in a sense, doesn't have a very well, a very distinct classical expansion uh, in the sense that quantum pieces will mix with classical pieces if you're just only keeping track of the order of Q. So it will be important to try to dig out the right contribution of the right order in, in GM times Q. Okay, is that clear? So this is one of the most important points, which I think is underappreciated. Okay. So what are the pieces that we're looking for inside of a scattering amplitude? The pieces that we're looking for, so leading order, this will be like 1 p.m. The scaling is a bit different. So leading order, there's only one diagram, which is just some exchange diagram. 
and this goes like g n to the fourth m to the fourth because there's two derivatives at each vertex in in uh, in gravity over q squared from the propagator okay and this if you Fourier transform this will just give the usual newtonian potential g n over r um but if you go to npm order this will look like so the leading order is gm to the fourth over q squared and then you want to have g m q to the n minus one okay and and by looking at the power here this means that the npm corrections will be encoded in the L plus one loop amplitude. You might be initially confused why am I talking about loop amplitudes, but clearly gravity is nonlinear, right? So it has order like corrections to all orders in G, uh, like in general relativity. So, so th those had to be encoded somewhere and where they're encoded are, are in loops. Um, and, and so the takeaway lesson from here is that uh, that the NPM correction will go like Q to the N minus three or equivalently to Q to the two minus L where L is the loop order in the amplitude. Um, so we will calculate some amplitude and we will expand it in small Q and we will try to find the correction that goes like Q to the two L. Any questions? Okay, so let's uh, actually explain how to how to expand. Uh, so in this picture I drew, which is still here on the right hand side, basically what we want is small q in total, but we also want all of these intermediate matter propagators. To remain approximately on shell because we want this to describe some classical motion some like semi-classical behavior of, of the amplitude uh, and that means that not only this q has to be small but but all the loop momenta uh, meaning all the in intermediate momentum exchanges that happen in this like space-time process they have to also be of the same order as q so they have to be small um, so we call usually we call this the soft expansion This is basically the classical limit. So there's two kinds of momenta. One of them we call hard. So an example is the external legs. So PI, these are matter propagators. So these are, these are matter momenta. Uh, so these are order M. And then we have the soft legs, which are all the uh, loop momenta, which are inside of, the, of some diagram. So this go like, order Q, the equivalent of this go like order Q over M. And I told you that this is the smallest quantity in the problem, which encodes classical versus quantum. So this is much smaller than M. So you want to expand in the limit where, where the loop momenta or the graviton momenta are much smaller than the, than the matter momenta. So we're going to do this by example, uh, rather than tell you some, some general story. I'm just going to work out some example and then describe kind of the general rules for, for power counting. So my example is this diagram here. For now, let's ignore the, the numerator. Um, so let's just think of this as a, some, some integral. So it's, an integral, there's an integrand. What is this? This is d for L. We give some labels. So this is going to be L, which is one, two, three, four. And this momentum is going to be Q minus L. Um, this is going to be L minus P2. So this is simply L squared, L minus Q squared. And then it's L minus P2 squared minus mass. And let, let, let's say that these guys have mass M1 
in these legs have mass M2, just to distinguish them. So this, I can just expand and use the initial condition P squared equals M2 squared. And this is just gonna be minus two L dot P plus L squared. Okay, so how do we do, how do we do this expansion? So we wanna expand uh, for momenta, which are of the order of Q. So naively what we would have to do is to, um, to separate this integral into different uh, so-called regions. Uh, so we would put some cutoff in between, some, some scale, which is in between Q and M, right? And then separate this integral for L smaller than lambda and L greater than lambda. We would call this contribution hard. So I will call this contribution hard. Okay, so what I wanna explain now is first of all, how to do the expansion and, and second, what kind of physics do these two contributions encode? And you'll see why these are the ones that we're interested in. Okay, so actually let, let, let's start with the one that we are not interested in. Let's start with this hard contribution. Okay, so in this hard contribution, we have the momenta are much bigger than Q. So that means Q is the smallest momentum in that diagram. Uh, so kind of the integral over the hard region, so this is L much greater than Q of the integral that we had before, D for L, L squared, and then it's Q squared, and it's two P2 dot L plus L squared we see that we can expand this propagator here because L is much greater than Q. So to leading order, this is just gonna be D for L, L squared squared, because we just said Q equals zero. And then it's two P2 dot L plus L squared. And here we're gonna have one uh, minus Q squared, that's two Q dot L over L squared. Um, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Okay. So now, if we, if we just count powers of Q, so let's count the leading order. So this one here, we have um, four momenta L. Um, so L here doesn't scale like Q at all. L scales, scales like the mass. So that means that this leading order doesn't know about Q. So this is order Q to the zero. And now this order here. Uh, if we, if we count, we have powers of Q in the numerator. Um, so we see that this, this thing will be, uh, will be of order Q squared. So in fact, this piece, because it's odd, will, will vanish and we will we'll only have the Q squared piece. So what, it, what is the physics of, of this kind of corrections in the amplitude? So these are things which are analytic in Q squared. These are, this is just a polynomial in Q squared that is encoded by this hard region. And what is that in, in, in position space? So if we have some, like the 3D Fourier transform of this kind of polynomial, like 2N. This is some local contact interaction. This is something that looks like some number of derivatives acting on delta of R. And in fact, these are things that we can not actually predict using, using the, our effective theory because there's some short distance effect. And in fact, there's, there are operators that we could add to our Lagrangian that have a coefficient that encode things like this. So this will look like some operator where you have uh, like some number of derivatives acting on, on phi to the fourth or like phi one squared phi two squared where these are the, the fields that describe the two, two different particles. And uh, so this is some non-universal prediction that, that will depend on the microscopics. Uh, so th this physics is not, have nothing to do with, with the classical limit or the Poznan calculus. Cosmic Cartesian expansion. What about the soft? Okay, so the soft expansion, what we have is soft, 
And this means uh, L is uh, of the order of Q. We have D for L, L squared, so minus Q squared, minus two P dot L, it's L squared. So now we see that this is homogeneous in Q because L scales like Q squared. This is homogeneous because L scales like Q. This is not homogeneous. This thing, there's P that scales like the mass, L that scales like Q. So here I have this goes like Q, this goes like Q squared. So I can expand it in, in small Q. So to leading order, this will be D for L, L squared on minus Q squared minus two P two dot L. And it will be one plus things that look like L squared dot L. Okay, um, so something nice happened. This, this propagator became linearized. So notice that that means that the mass of this particle, if we write PI as some mass and some four velocity, this will factor out of the integral. But in addition, we can now power count again. So the leading order here, let's see, we have four powers of Q from the, from the measure. Remember L scales as Q. In the denominator, we have L squared, so Q squared, L minus Q squared, this also goes like Q squared, and this only has one power of L, so this goes linear. So we have Q squared, Q squared, Q, so this goes like one over absolute value of Q. In fact, there will be an inverse power of the mass here. And then all these other corrections, we, we are gonna go like uh, like um, like some even power of Q uh, multi multiplying this. So we see that this thing is not analytic as opposed to these uh, polynomials in Q that we got from the, this hard region. Um, this thing here is non-analytic, and what it means is that if we transform something like one over absolute value of Q, because it's non-analytic, this is gonna give me a long distance contribution. So this goes like one over R, R squared. And this was a one loop diagram. So you see that this will have a G squared in the numerator. And, and this will be the kind of corrections, these classical corrections that we are, we are interested in this Fosman Kaskin correction. Okay. So you might, you might worry that we are splitting this domain um, into kind of this soft region, this hard region. So it looks like we have some cutoffs lying around, but here we use some technical tool, which is called the method of regions uh, by Menek and Smirnov that um, they tell us that you can basically forget, in most cases, uh, you can forget that we had some cutoff because if you actually now take this expanded integrand and integrate it over the hard region, then you will see that the, the, the resulting integral is scaleless. And in, in dimensional regularization, we can just set those integrals. By definition, they're set to zero. So if we, if we, if we use the dimensional regularization as our, uh, as our uh, scheme for integration, um, then we can, we can just integrate over the whole domain. And in, in other contexts, this is a bit more subtle. So one has to worry about this, this overlap between the, between the different regions, but, but for this soft expansion, there's no, there's no overlap. So the hard region and the soft region, um, they, they just give different contributions that encode different physics, okay? Um, so the lesson here is that uh, by, by doing this expansion, we've, we've separated the physics that we're interested in and the physics that we are not interested in. So now, before taking a break, the last thing I wanna do um, is to, um, to give you some rules for power counting in this soft expansion. So that if you actually have some integral, some, some contribution to your amplitude, you can tell exactly to which orders it contributes and if it has a piece that you're interested in or not. Okay, so the rules are simple. So these kind of vertices, right? So this three point amplitude in gravity. So this is some scalar, this is a graviton. So this goes like E dot P squared where P is the momentum of the scalar. And I told you that the P scale like, uh, like masses. So this thing goes like 
like the mass square to leading order. And uh, so these kind of like three graviton vertices, or in fact, any multi-graviton vertex is always gonna go like, like Li, Lj, that's dot, dot, dot. Um, there's also some, some epsilon floating around, but this means that this space like Q squared, and then we already said that graviton propagators, uh, so these, these, they just go like one over L squared. So these two, they just always stay like one over Q squared. And uh, some minor propagator that which, which has been kicked slightly, very slightly off shell by, by some interaction. So this uh, I have P, this is like, this is L equals L. So leading order, this will go like one over L dot P, which means it goes like one over the mass times Q. So with these very simple rules, we can just draw our favorite diagram and, and count to which order it contributes and, and see if, uh, if it has um, a plasmic Haskin contribution in it. Okay, so a remainder, reminder, the uh, classical, like the PM corrections and L loops, I told you that they go like Q to the two minus L. Okay, so let's let's start from from this diagram that we were we using our favorite example. Um, okay, so this is two loops. So in gravity, you have square root of g for each vertex. If it's a two graviton vertex, it has or each graviton in a vertex gives a square root of g. So this thing is going to go like g squared. Okay, now we have two matter uh, two matter vertices on this side. So if this is like one. This is like two. That means that there's um, all powers of the mass. We have one on this side. This means that we have um, one squared. And then one matter propagator on M2. So that's going to be like N1Q. And there's two graviton propagators and the measure. So this is Q to the fourth. Um, and this is uh, Q squared squared. So let me write this in some convenient way. This is in one squared, two squared, over Q squared, and it's G and two Q. So indeed, we see that this diagram directly encodes a two PN correction in it. So everything is relative to the to the leading order, which is classical. A more interesting one. This guy, so now the, the only difference is that we have one extra matter propagator compared to this diagram. Okay, so, uh, so let's say we have two matter vertices on each side. So this is G squared and one to the fourth and two to the fourth. And then we have two right on propagators, G squared squared. Um, we have the measure Q to the fourth. And then we have M1 Q, M2 Q. From each one of these guys. So this propagator using our rules here gives us this power. So this thing looks a bit funny because this two leading order is uh, gm one squared and two squared over q squared. And this just goes like gm one and two. So we see that the leading order here doesn't actually give us some some new pm correction. And and Tomorrow we'll see in detail that what, what is encoded in this contribution here, the leading contribution from this diagram is actually some, ex, some term in this expansion of the exponential. Remember I told you that the amplitude is something like e to the i s minus one and I need to expand this exponential. So there's a, a piece that goes like one PM squared um, just the three level squared. And you can see this intuitively because this essentially looks like two iterated interactions that look like the, the three level diagram. So this is what is encoded here. This is basically the 1 PM squared correction. So we need to expand to high orders in, in Q. Um, so, um, so as I told you, the, the Q expansion is an expansion in Q over M. Uh, so the next order, so this thing will be multiplied by 
what by q q over m1 it will be a piece q over m2 as that a dot so let's see this subleading piece here will look like actually we have the same thing here let me It's going to be uh... so we are just canceling one of these these powers at a time. And indeed we get a correction that looks of the right order. So this would be some sort of 2 p.m. correction. It turns out that when you calculate the resulting integral, this is zero in four dimensions, but more generally, more generally it's not in, in, in higher dimensions. Okay, so, um, and then the last example that I wanna do, or maybe two very quick examples, I think that are quantum or that they should be quantum just to see that we can ignore them altogether. So these are, the first one is this kind of graviton loop. So intuitively this should be quantum. This is some quantum correction to the, to the graviton propagator. And indeed, if we power count, let's see, we have four graviton propagators. So we have the measure Q to the fourth. We have four graviton propagators, Q squared, to the fourth, and then we have g squared and one squared and two squared just from these vertices. And as expected, this thing looks like m one squared and two squared or q squared times g q squared. And this doesn't look like a PM correction. This is something that goes like q over m Planck squared. So this is quantum indeed. So, so this class of diagrams, they won't contribute to the classical dynamics as one might expect. Um, so there's more subtle diagrams like this one, where some naive counting. So if you, if you repeat the counting, basically we are multiplying the counting of this diagram by the counting of the tree level diagram and dividing by some extra matter propagator. So one would conclude that this is Q to the zero, which is Q to the two minus two, which are two loops it looks like classical. Um, so this is some annoying feature that, that I, as I said, the Q expansion of the, this, uh, this exponential here, it mixes quantum classical. There can be Q over Q, there can be H bar over H bar. So we will have to work a bit harder to, to see that those pieces, things that look like this actually don't contribute to, to the classical dynamics. Okay, so just two quick comments. Before, um, before taking a break. So the first one is that we saw that uh, there's this uh, so-called super classical or classically singular contributions that went like, like uh, say one pm squared, but more generally like like some product of lower pm contributions. So we will have to understand how to uh, how to deal with those. Also, we saw that there is kind of um, h bar over h bar. So this is uh, quantum and super classical. Like this diagram here, we will also need to understand how to get rid of these guys because clearly this shouldn't contribute to the classical dynamics. So these are things which are annoying and we will solve uh, after the break. And then some two nice things, let me just say it in words about this expansion that we were discussing is that we see that doing this classical expansion of the amplitude, the, the mass scaling becomes very, very clear. So we see each diagram at the right order which powers of the mass in which combination that they should contribute. So this is useful in the context of the self-force expansion that Justin was talking about. 
where um, one expands in the limit where one of the masses is much bigger than the other. So using these simple power counting rules after you're, you're expanded in Q, we can also keep track of the masses. So it's very simple to, to see um, uh, which pieces will contribute to which given order in, in this self force expansion. And similarly here, I didn't talk about velocities, but basically having more or less powers of mass, these powers of mass come from momenta here. So similarly, one could also keep track of, of how many powers of uh, uh, u1.u2, which is kind of the, the, the velocity-like variable in, in the problem that we'll be talking about more next, um, each, each diagram has. So one can also, at the same time as we keep track of the masses, one can keep track of of this velocity scaling, the naive velocity scaling before before integration. Okay, uh, so with those two comments, I think we can take a break. Uh, yeah. Say fast, and we, you can ask a question. Sure, go ahead. Um, what happens if you apply this uh, soft power counting to mushrooms? So you you just find that they're classical. So, but for context, for everyone else, uh, a mushroom is this kind of integral, which uh, you have a two loops or at one loop, you would have something that looks like this. So at one loop, there is an accident. So at one loop, what happens is that this sort of integral actually doesn't have any Q scaling. So if you calculate it in the separate expansion, you find that it's scaleless. So just zero in, in, in the reg. But, but once you attach this to anything else, then now this, you can count that has uh, classical counting or even super classical. Um, so, so the Q counting just tells you that you should keep track of these pieces. Uh, now what we'll, we'll see is that if you're only interested in the conservative dynamics, then one can rule, rule these out. Um, but for the full dissipative dynamics, uh, including radiation, th those things are important. Okay. Um, okay, so I guess we can we can continue. I, hopefully I answer your question. And, um, yes, thank you. Oh, sure. Um, okay, so now we're gonna talk about uh, how to separate this conservative versus dissipative part or potential radiation, near zone, how, far zone. We'll be making connection with, with Justin's uh, uh, tutorial. So we, we, we've been talking about relativistic velocities. So but in order to talk about this, even when, if we are gonna resum velocity series, it's, it's useful to think about uh, velocity because of the following facts. So the, the kind of easiest definition of uh, some conservative effect in a, in a scattering process is just some effect which is time reversal even. So something that doesn't distinguish between initial state and final state. So if we, if we expand in small velocities, the amplitude, we know in the end we'll be interested in the full velocity series. But if we expand in small velocities, we will find that there's three kinds of pieces. Uh, certain pieces actually blow up for small velocities. They go like one over V. And okay, so nothing should blow up at small velocities in the classical dynamics. So we, we will see that these correspond to these super classical parts, uh, like the leading order expansion of this box integral, uh, um, this, this example that, that we explained. Um, and uh, so, so these things uh, we will have to deal with separately, but then the, the non-singular part, there will be kind of a time reversal even part and a time reversal odd part. Time reversal odd part is they're just odd powers of, of, v, of V over C versus time reversal even, there will be even powers of, of V over C. So it's clear that, that the conservative stuff has to be hidden uh, inside of, of these even powers, but there could also be kind of uh, effects that are kind of odd squared that the lowest orders you can have something like that, but at high orders you can have what I call like conservative radiation reaction or, or effects which are in essence dissipative, but but they contribute even orders in the in the velocity expansion. Okay, so we want to cleanly separate these things, um, and for that it's useful to think about what would happen if we expanded for small velocities, even though in the end we'll be writing the the, the amplitude and and the classical objects for for arbitrary velocities. So how do we separate? So the same way that we use this different scaling of momenta into soft and hard to, to distinguish classical versus quantum, we also we can also power count in, in velocity um, to, to understand which part is conservative and which is dissipative. Okay, so the so the matter momenta 
uh, well, obviously, there. If we separate into energy and and spatial components of their form momenta, the energy component just goes to linear order like the mass, and and the spatial component goes like like the velocity. But then we can have several kinds of of gravitons. So we can. Uh, so they're all order Q. So they're all soft in in the sense of classical, where Q is much smaller than M. But we can have what what I will call quantum soft, which are things that don't scale at all with velocity. So these are things which are not suppressed in the small velocity limit at all. Okay, and then there will be pieces that are called potential where the energy component is order V. And because V is a small quantity, the energy component is much smaller than the spatial component. And then the last time the radiation where the energy component is of the order of, of the um, spatial component. Okay, so, uh, so which one of these corresponds to conservative dynamics? So it's kind of easy to see that of these three, it can only be this one. Why? Because these gravitons, because the energy and, and three uh, free momentum components are comparable size, these guys can be on shell, these two. So these are smaller, but both of these can be on shell. And that means that if you have some intermediate graviton in some process, actually there's a chance that it will escape to infinity. It will just become a real graviton and it will just propagate to infinity. Um, whereas these potential modes, they're, they're completely off shell. So if you have energy components of order V, there's no way that it, that energy component is ever gonna cancel against um, um, against the spatial component to give zero, which is what you would get in the on-shell condition for the graviton, that L squared has to be has to be zero, okay? So it's clear that the conservative dynamics will be encoded in these, these potential modes. So if we just want to understand the conservative Part of the process, and this corresponds to the to the near zone in in just in uh, well, roughly at least to, to to the first few orders that corresponds to the near zone. Um, uh, then we will have to integrate out. These potential gravitons. Um, so in practice, what does this mean? If we have some graviton momentum, right, that we were keeping homogeneous because it, these things scale like Q, in terms of its velocity scaling, we should separate these into its like energy component and the free momentum. And we said that potential gravitons, uh, V is much smaller than one. So we, we know that the energy component is much smaller than, than this component. So if I expand this, I have one over. And we see that indeed all of these corrections will be of the order omega squared over L squared. So L squared doesn't scale with velocity. Omega, which is the energy component, as I told you, it scales with velocity. So this will be order v to the zero. This will order v squared, and we will always have even powers and velocity. Um, so we see that indeed the contributions to the amplitude that we get from these potential gravitons will be time reversal even. Okay, so some properties of these guys, uh, these potential gravitons. Okay, so as I told you, they're off shell. That means they can never escape infinity. Um, as I told you, there's this time reversal even, but then also what they mediate is some instantaneous interactions. And this is very similar to what I said, because all the dependence on the energy is analytic in this series, right? We just have powers of the energy, even powers of the energy. Um, that means that if I fully transform in the, in, in, to, to the time, then what I'm gonna get are delta functions in time and derivatives on delta functions. In time. Okay, so, so this encodes some instantaneous potential uh, between, between the two bodies. Uh, which is why we call this potential gravity. Okay, so, um, 
So what we need to understand now is, well, if we are only interested in the conservative dynamics, we will just care about these potential gravitons and we should learn how to power count in, in velocity, some, some given diagram, and we will see what are the advantages of that. So, so let's just do some example. So let's go back to this guy that we had here. And we already saw before that a leading order in the classical expansion, then this was uh, um, L squared, and then Q squared, and it's 2p dot L. Okay, um, so now if we expand uh, graviton propagators like this, then to leading order in velocity, this is just gonna be, so let me separate the spatial components. So it's gonna be like special squared. And then this guy will be a bit different. So these guys were not homogeneous in velocity, so we need to expand it, but this one is actually homogeneous in velocity because remember, P goes like one B in velocity, whereas L for potential goes like B one. Okay, so we'll have this integral and then, sorry, I forgot the other propagator. This is one, two, three, four, and this is L. Okay. Um, and then here we have some energy integral, d omega. And uh, so for convenience, let me parameterize, let me go to the rest frame of one of the guys. So let me write uh, P1 equals one, zero, zero, zero. P2 equals basically one plus V squared zero, zero, V. Okay, so this integral will just be omega. So here will be important to keep track of I epsilon, which so far we've been ignoring. Uh, so there's a minus sign that comes from here. And then, um, and then there's the other one, omega, the leading order, this is just one. So this is gonna be omega minus V um, LZ. Okay, so, uh, so this integral, we can just calculate by residues. And we see that because there's a minus omega here and plus omega here, there's a pole in the upper half plane and a pole in the lower half plane. Um, so actually the other way around, this is on the, the lower half plane. Um, so, so this integral, we could just calculate by residues and any given residue is just gonna give a factor of one over VLZ. This thing is gonna go like V3L one over L squared, and then it's Q squared. Um, it will be an overall factor of one over velocity and then LZ. Okay, so, okay, we, we didn't really need to calculate this by residues. We could have just counted here that the energy has order V Everything here has order V. So we have V, 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 this is one over V squared. So we see that indeed this integral has this one over V squared. We did this one over V. And th then this thing is homogeneous in velocity. Okay, so, so we've seen that these pieces that didn't look quite classical, that I was calling super classical or iteration, things that look like products of, of lower loop or, or pre um, uh, processes, um, these things will have inverse powers of velocity. So they're very easy to distinguish. If you're only interested in some actual Postman Kaskin correction, you will see that it cannot be encoded in something that has a one over velocity. And tomorrow we will see how we can actually subtract these pieces to extract the, the interesting part of the amplitude. But so far, I've, ju I've just explained how to tag, tag this contribution. Okay, so what about this other issue that, that I explained? There was this issue of uh, uh, interference between quantum stuff and classical stuff. Um, I'm gonna go here first. So we have this integral. 
that looked kind of dangerous because this thing gave us too many one over Qs and this thing gave us too many Qs so that this was Q to the zero, which is the right order for, for a two loop quantity. But actually it's easy to see that if we look at the different regions, this only receives contribution from one of the velocity regions. So in particular in the potential region, in the potential region, we will see that there is a loop here where all the propagators are graviton propagators. So this loop here, if I call this L1, this L2, this integral, there will be other stuff, but inside there will be a D4 L2, L squared, L2 uh, squared, L1 minus L2 squared. And if I expand, this will give me something that has an integral over the energy, but no, dependent, no dependence at all in the energy. And then uh, D3L, Two L two spatial squared L one minus L two spatial. We see that automatically in the potential region, all these graviton loops are set to zero. So it's clear that they won't affect uh, this this um, this conservative dynamics um, because this integral over the energy is scaleless. So there's no pole to pick up anywhere. Uh, so this integral will just will just give us. Uh, uh, zero or some UV divergence, which is quantum. So the, this will give us something which is a delta function at worst, a delta function in time, but uh, but um, um, but in particular it's scaleless. So so we just see that it's zero. What about these other regions? So we we we, we could also decide that some of these other propagators are we? are radiation instead of potential. So what would happen if we say that uh, this thing? Like, let me know it. We'll finish soon. Let me. Um, so, uh, okay. Did, did someone say something? Sorry. Okay. Um, so this was the case where they were all potential. Let's see. Can we have a few being being radiation? Well, we cannot have a two radiation, one potential vertex, because the, the size of the, mom, the for momentum conservation, we have to have that all the momenta coming inside of some vertex, they have to have uh, similar scaling. Um, so the only option is something like this, where, where this guy here is radiation and the others are potential. And in fact, because the radiation momentum is much smaller than the others, so this was in the like potential, so if this was potential plus radiation, then we just see that that we we this has this has an overall factor of v suppression versus this guy, which starts at order v at order v to the zero. Um, so we will see again that that the, the the resulting integral looks more like after expansion looks more like something like this, where you have a tadpole attached here and then some like multiple propagators here. And again, this is scaleless. This L two integral will be scaleless. And I, I will. I won't go over the radiation region, uh, but uh, the, something similar happens. So if one does the power counting in the where all the gravitons are radiation, one finds that uh, that the integral is scaleless. So that means that what, what did we learn from all of this? So the lesson for so the velocity scaling. Allows two things. First, tagging super classical or iterations. So just a reminder, these were things that came from expanding the semi-classical exponential. And um, the second thing uh, we can identify the uh, quantum time superclassical as, uh, as this region that I called quantum soft. So this is where the momenta go like Q, but they have no velocity scaling at all. So the spatial momenta and their, uh, their energy components uh, are, uh, they don't have any suppression in velocity. Um, and then the last thing is to, to isolate conservative.
the, the conservative dynamics. Um, so we see that the velocity scaling is very useful, even though we will end up resumming in, in velocities. Okay, so how how long do, do I have left? Okay, so uh, I think you still have uh, 20 minutes. Uh, oh, okay, uh, great. So then I can tell you how do we actually calculate these, these diagrams using unitarity very briefly. Um, So, so far, I've just taken the diagrams as given. Uh, but in practice, this is a calculation of loop amplitudes and gravity. So if you've ever worked out the Feynman rules, then uh, you know that this won't be a fun calculation. Um, so, um, Let's explain how do we actually do this. Okay, so as I said, Feynman diagrams. Are typically a recipe for disaster calculations, uh, so we want to use unitarity. So what is the basic idea of the unitarity method? The basic idea is the integrand of a loop amplitude. So we want to, I want to write the amplitude as a sum, sum over diagrams. Um, there's some like multi-loop integral um, and something that looks like a numerator for each diagram that will depend on the, on the loop momenta, it will depend on external momenta. And there will be some product of your propagators belonging to that diagram. So this is this integral, the sum over these diagrams, ignoring the loop integration, is just some rational function. And as such, it's fixed by its residues. But we know what the residues are, and that's what unitarity and factorization tell us. So unitarity, factorization, tell us that, that if I set some propagator on shell, so if I calculate the residue, it's actually the product of some lower loop. Lower number of legs amplitude. But this is the simplest case, but this also works for, for loop diagrams. Okay, uh, so the unitarity method basically consists and let's write an ansatz for, uh, or one incarnation of the Utrani method uh, proceeds by just writing an ansatz for all of these numerators. So we know the set of graphs. We write an ansatz based on these power counting rules that I explained. Uh, so if I have time, I'll do one example. And then we just impose that in, on every time we set something on shell, that th that ansatz has to agree with what factorization or, or unitarity tells me. Okay, but actually it's, uh, in here, because we're interested in this classical dynamics, and in particular, let's say we focus on conservative, there's extra rules uh, to see which class of terms we need to encode. Because of course, this is the full quantum amplitude. So you would have to uh, check every single factorization channel, at every single unitarity cut to make sure you have the full quantum amplitude. But in, indeed, uh, um, for the classical amplitude, there's pieces that we know won't, won't tell us anything. Uh, so what are the simplifications? Um, so I told you that there cannot be no matter contacts. So no contributions that look like this or anything like this. This will be some, this will be some, this is actually a vertex, not, not an amplitude. So this will be some short distance contribution that uh, first of all, we can't predict because we don't have a theory of quantum gravity. And second, uh, um, we won't affect the classical dynamics. And then for conservative, the potential, we need at least one matter propagator that 
for loop. Okay, so this this is because otherwise, as I explained with with this uh, with this uh, example, this quantum contribution, if there is a loop without any matter propagators, the energy integration is scaleless, so it gives you zero. Okay, um, and and of course, uh, I won't write it down, but uh, this numerator can have pieces which are obviously quantum just by power counting in Q. So you don't really need an ansatz for the whole thing. You just need to encode the classical piece that you're interested in. Okay, so let's do this in practice for, for the simplest example of, of one loop. And let's spell out the steps. Actually, let me do it here. Steps. So the first step is to write an ansatz. And uh, okay, so we al already learned how to power count at one loop, and, and we saw that the only diagrams that actually have classical contributions can be things like, like a box. This one we didn't count, but it's just some relabeling where I swap two and three of the box. So there's some non-planar version. There's diagrams like this. There's the, the opposite diagram. And actually I cannot have anything like this because this will be quantum. I can just ignore these, these guys. Uh, also, they don't have one matter propagator per loop, which was one of our rules. So we really just need to write an ansatz for these diagrams. And if we if we allow powers of this inverse propagator, this encodes any other contact term in the amplitude that that we want. Um, um, so, for instance, let's do let, let's do a, an example. This diagram here. And because we want to encode pieces that actually look like this diagram, we shouldn't allow anything in the numerator that can pinch one of these propagators. Because any propagator that we pinch, this will go to higher order in Q. So that will already be quantum. So effectively, um, I call this L. Again, this is Q. This is two. Effectively, that means that L squared equals zero, L minus Q squared equals zero. And um, and it's two p two dot l uh, plus l squared equals zero. Uh, so we won't have any pieces that look like this in the numerator. And then the the power counting that we were discussing before the break tells us that this guy will have let's see, so it has one vertex here, so you can have up to uh, two powers of p one um, or or the masses. Then there's Two vertices here, so you can have up to four powers of P2 or, or the masses. By momentum conservation, the only remaining scale is Q. Um, so there's there's a three graviton vertex here, so at least it, there should be a Q squared, something of order Q squared in the numerator. Okay, so we just need to write the most general polynomial that has the right dimension and, and, um, and it has this scaling. And, and actually this is very simple because there's only three, like there's only four terms. So the numerator for this diagram, so let me just get the end triangle. So, okay, so it has to be order Q squared. So one possibility is Q squared itself. And here I'll have M1 to the third, M2 to the fourth, M1, to cubed Q1 dot P2. And the only other thing that I can write is L dot P1 squared and then M2 to the fourth.
So in the unitarity method, we just learned that if we want to know what is the classical contribution that from a diagram like this, we just need to determine these four coefficients here. And the way we do this is by, by making this ansatz, I would, would also write an ansatz for the other graphs, just using the same, the same ideas. And we would require that those match a unitarity cut. So the relevant unitarity cut here uh, is the one that looks like the diagram. It will be to match the cut. The cut looks like this. So on the one hand, this thing is the product, like the sum of our polarizations of the product of these three point amplitudes. So let's call this L, let's call this Q, Q prime, let's call this M minus Q, just would be like three point amplitude that has four, three point amplitude of like E2, E2 prime L, three point amplitude of uh, minus P2 prime, L minus Q, um, P4, P3, and then a four point amplitude. P1, P4, minus L, minus L minus Q. And the sum over polarizations, we just need to do like the typical sum over state. So for any graviton polarization that we would find, we will find the polarization complex conjugate on the other side of the, the cut or one of them will be incoming, one of them will be going, and this will be, essentially will be something like eta mu nu, uh, like rho sigma plus like other contributions. So let me just be vague here, but, but this is the usual completeness relation. But on, on the other hand, this should be equal to, to the sum of our diagrams. On the other hand, if we blow up this four point amplitude, this should be reproduced by, by uh, this sum of our diagrams. This L minus Q, we have the cross version. So the, the top here gets fixed and, and what we are doing is writing the three different diagrams that we have for this Compton amplitude. And the last diagram is, is this guy here. Okay, so we, ha we had constructed an ansatz for each one of these graphs of the form like this. And then we can compute the right hand side as a product of trees, uh, which are much simpler quantities. And then we just require that th these two things are equal. This written in terms of our ansatz, and this product of three amplitudes. Okay, and, and that's why we how we construct the integrands. We don't need to compute any Feynman diagrams. Uh, and, and this is very efficient. And just to show you uh, that this is efficient, I will draw the cuts that we use at higher loops. Uh, so as I showed you at, at one loop, uh, there were only essentially two diagrams. There were just the box and the triangle and then the symmetric versions. And there was one cut. So if I match this triangle cut, all the information about the amplitude is encoded in there because all the classical diagrams appear in this cut. And, and the pieces that I'm missing are the pieces where I collapse the matter propagator or I collapse the two graviton propagators, which we argued they're quantum. So at one loop, there's one cut, which is this one. And there's two diagrams that we need to write an answer for two loops. There are three cuts, only three cuts for the conservative. So if we want uh, radiation effects, there's, there's more pieces that we need to keep track of, but, um, but um, here, uh, two loops for the conservative part, there's only three cuts, which are these three cuts. This is called the W cut. There's the N cut. And then there's the H cut. And then at uh, three loops, so this is the recent calculation that we did to get the 4 p.m. the conserv 
most of the conservative part of the of the uh, 4 p.m. Hamiltonian, um, the three loops there is actually only eight cuts in 40 diagrams. Of course, plus their symmetric versions. So we just need to write an ansatz for essentially 40 things uh, if we want to do a full free loop calculation in gravity. And we just need to compute four products of these three amplitudes um, in order to, to find the relevant pieces of, of the integrand. Okay. So I don't have time to tell you, as, as I expected, I don't have to tell you anything about integration. Uh, but I guess we've given many talks about this, uh, both me and my collaborators. So I, you can ask me, or, or I can direct you to one of those. Um, so tomorrow, what we will do is um, we will take this amplitude. So now we understand the structure of the amplitude uh, expanded both in velocity and in, um, in the classical limit. So we will see how if I, we take that expanded amplitude as an input, how we can extract the, quant the classical quantities that we are interested in, such as a two-body Hamiltonian or, or um, some on-shell uh, effective action from which we can extract directly uh, um, observables uh, for the scattering process. Uh, so I think with that, I will finish today. And if you guys have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Okay, thank you very much, Julio. Yes, we have about 10 minutes for uh, specific questions, and then we can go on. If you can stay on, we can go on with a more informal discussion.